Okay, so there are other people that are using these as well because the idea is if it's good enough for astronauts, it's good enough for me. Okay, so people at Cambridge University, this is uh, like citing a Guardian article I read. People are saying, modafinil increases my enthusiasm for studying. It makes me feel that lazing around is the last thing I want to do. So this is making other things in the environment that are normally boring, like studying, <laughs> seem more stimulating. Uh, modafinil gives me motivation that otherwise lack. And somebody says, once I've taken a pill, I can stay up all night without stopping. It just works so well. I need it. Now, she could be talking about MDMA, but actually she's talking about modafinil. Okay, so just a little bit about some of the psychological effects. Uh, people have found that they do have small but significant effects in attention and working memory. Now remember, attention is something that meditation boosts, and working memory is supposed to be boosted by that brain training game and contribute to your intelligence. Um, also, in children with ADHD, it's significantly improved attention. So it could be for some of the people that are more lower functioning, um, they actually gain more from stimulant drugs than if you're already high functioning. So it could be something that could try to equalise things a little bit. Um, it's also supposed to be very effective in treating bipolar depression. So again, a lot of it seems to be working on motivation, because one of the problems that children with ADHD have is that they just get really, really easily bored. They don't find stuff interesting, and that's why they're so jittery, because they're looking for stimulation. Okay, so that's fair to what I've just said. Do stimulants actually really affect our reward expectation and our reward mechanisms more than the cognitive aspects of our attention? Okay, some of the disadvantages of taking a stimulant is the problems that you basically have with all drugs, but especially those that affect dopamine. Um, any drug, obviously, you can develop a tolerance, so you need more of it to get the same effect. You can have a problem with dependency, meaning that you're unable to function without the drug. You can get addicted to the drug, desiring to take it more often, and it can be hard to resist taking it. And obviously you can have withdrawal effects when you feel bad for not taking the drug. Now, arguably I'd say all of these effects are true to a certain extent of coffee. <laughs> so if, if coffee has these effects on it, stronger stimulants are only going to be worse, I should imagine. Okay, uh, the next one then I've come up with is exercise. Um, now, people already know that exercise is good for you, I'm just going to say a few other things about it and how it affects your cognition. Exercise causes changes to our conscious experience, particularly it can decrease our feelings of pain and anxiety and uh, increase our feelings of relaxation and well-being. Um, now, I know that probably a lot of you are thinking at this point that this is endorphins, because that's what we've read in the media for years and years, but not necessarily because the idea with endorphins is that we do know they are released by exercise and we do know that they can cause a bit of reduced pain, but we don't know that they cause some of the other things that are associated with it. So recent studies have actually suggested that exercise might be releasing endogenous cannabinoids in your body. Uh, now what these are are naturally occurring neurotransmitters that are mimicked by drugs like cannabis, and that's how they found out what they were, so that's why they're called endogenous cannabinoids. Now, um, it could be, it's been suggested by quite a lot of sports scientists recently that endogenous cannabinoids might actually be the mechanism by which people get a runner's high, more so than endorphins, which is what we've thought for many, many years. Now, some of the other things that exercise can do is that it massively increases neurogenesis, which is the creation of new brain cells, uh, especially in the campus of your brain. This is one of the things that uh, Marius was talking about earlier on, although he was talking about it with regards to an enriched environment. So both an enriched environment and exercise can cause uh, an increase in neurogenesis, uh, but they seem to do so via different mechanisms. So you can actually try to do both and try to get the best of both worlds. Uh, now, further to that mechanism of neurogenesis in the hippocampus, it's known that in people that are depressed, which is pretty much the most common mental illness, uh, the hippocampus can actually atrophy, meaning to shrink. Um, and so perhaps this is one of the reasons why depression is so good, sorry, why exercise is so good for treating depression, because it might actually reverse those changes which are caused by environmental stress. Okay, there's another thing though, which is because a hippocampus is critical to the formation of new memories, it implies that exercise might also cognitively enhance learning in general, 
especially uh, episodic memories, uh, but also spatial and emotional memories that hippocampus is critical to. So it could just be that it enhances learning, and one group of scientists found that this does seem to be the case in old mice, like the sort that Aubrey de Grey wants us to get. Uh, so here we have old mice. Okay, fifth one, sugar. Okay, sugar is actually a cognitive enhancer. Reason being that our brains use as much as 25% of our calories, which for the size of the organ is really quite dramatic. Now, uh, low blood sugar is associated with poor performance on neuropsychological tests of self-control and willpower. And furthermore, people have found that your performance on these tests is depleted by, uh, sorry, your blood sugar is depleted by doing these tests. But also, if you give somebody a sugary drink, it can restore the uh, sort of fatigue effect on performance. So from this, you're probably thinking, does this mean we should numb down the sugar all the time? Uh, well, probably not. And the reason is that if you have, let me bring up the graph to show you, if you have something that's very, very high in refined sugars, which are massively in our diet, uh, especially um, in like Western countries with a uh, more modern diet, if you have lots and lots of sugar, then your body responds by releasing insulin. So what happens is you get a spike of blood sugar, and then when the insulin kicks in, it comes crashing back down again. So what this means is, is that the, because your brain relies upon a steady supply of glucose and self-control, that throughout the day, if you're having too much sugar in your diet, your self-control is going to go up and down. So you might work really, really hard for about half an hour, an hour or so, and afterwards, just not be able to concentrate on your work, feel pissed off and stressed out, and just not be able to function very well. So instead of having too much sugar, it's probably a much better idea to have low glycemic index foods. And what are these? These are things like uh, vegetables and oats. Uh, so what that means is that porridge is a positive answer. It's very low glycemic index. Have I really raised food up? Pretty good. Pretty good. Um, to just say some things that I didn't have time to mention then, because I was worried I wouldn't be able to cram all this in to 20 minutes. Yeah, just, just tell me when to stop. Um, thinking about the sugar and what uh, Professor Kevin Warwick said this morning about you can have an implant measuring your blood sugar if you have diabetes. You can have an implant measuring your blood sugar anyway, and it could warn you when your blood sugar is dropping below an optimum level, and like suggest to maybe send you a text or an email going, you should eat now. <laughs> you, you've been playing this computer game for six hours, or you know, you've been working all day without eating. Um, you might even have something that actually gave you a little trickle of glucose, just by just to keep you at an optimum level. Um, and thinking about what Ajit said about uh, meditation, um, to combine that with the, the sort of computer game kind of paradigm, uh, I'm very interested as well in what you were talking about, like biofeedback. So I had the picture earlier of the monk with the scalp electrodes because it's possible to very reliably measure the electrical activity that's going on inside people's brains when they're doing meditation, or anything else for that matter. And meditation appears to change these brain waves to different frequencies. Now, if you can get those displayed on the screen in front of you, then what you might be able to have is basically a brain training game that is also some form of meditation, which is pretty much exactly what Ajit was talking about. Um, so I'd basically just like to second that, but I think that's probably a very good idea. Um, I'm not quite sure how well it will work, but that remains to be seen. Um, I think that's that. Thanks. Go to the next speaker. Okay, thanks very much.